You guys have heard of TechCrunch. Um, hello. Fantastic. We've got some fantastic speakers now. We're now going to talk about, you know, we just had a discussion about scaling up in Europe. And now we've got two fantastic businesses um, who have not only scaled up in Europe, raised enormous amounts of funding. I think, what are you on now, uh, Sabina? 79 million euros? 100, round 100? Huh? Around 100? Around 100, sorry, I have old information. We need to update Crunchbase. And you've, got, you've raised a billion. Yep. You've raised a billion. So, a bit more. So maybe, uh, maybe, maybe European startups can raise a lot of money, huh? How about that? Let's have a round of applause. Come on, that's pretty cool. Um, how the hell did you do it? Sabina? We had product market fit, so we just needed more money to put sort of product top of the funnel. Fit. But KRY, I mean, we've seen these startups come out at, at the moment with these robo doctors, and that's what that is right now, yeah? It's kind of robo doctor. Tell us more. So I, I don't think it's, it's, it was, we're not there yet. Not quite that robo doctors. Sounds great. But, but it's video, video but you're doing a video call with a, with a yeah. doctor. So I mean, in healthcare, it's not technology that's kind of the barrier for digitalization, right? Yeah. It's, uh, it's two things. It's, it's uh, getting people comfortable with a new way of doing something that is very, very personal. And the second is, of course, the, the policies. So we have taken a different route than maybe some of our competitors. That is sort of one way of doing it is to put a mediocre chatbot in the hands of someone. And they have to ask, You're answer. Talking about, talking about Ada Health. Ada there, Health is a chatbot, an there, AI chatbot. There's a few of them. Uh -huh. And uh, then the patients answer 100 questions about sort of what symptoms they have, and then they get the probability of what diagnosis they have. But that's not really the use case, right? I mean, right. what you're looking for when you're sick is kind of speaking to an authority. To if describe. I wanted a sort of, a, I mean, I can Google my result, and it says you probably have cancer. But uh, when I'm sick, I, I want to speak to an authority that can tell me, should I be worried, should I not be? Someone that can pres prescribe me medicine, and then I kind of want it sent to my door. So we have an approach of, of sort of making this transition much more, I think, easy for everyone to accept. And I think that's, that's kind of where we, how we are attacking this market. Exactly. And so, but when you're scaling, you're actually trying to go up against national health systems, aren't you? And in Europe, as we know, they're notoriously state-owned. Um, the NHS in Britain is the biggest employer in the country. France's health system is massive and huge. Um, you're competing, you're not really competing against tech companies, are you? So, I mean, I think we all know why healthcare and education is kind of the last resort of digital, and that's because they're yeah. state-owned, right? I mean, in the best case scenario, we go in and we do this together with the public system. Mm. Um, I think healthcare will change a lot in Europe in the next five to 10 years. But I mean, we are really lucky to have the public system that pays for our healthcare, and that will remain, right? So it's more a matter of us coming in, uh, driving the change from within the system. Yeah. It's still gonna cause a little bit of uncomfort for the people that are there today, but sort of we need to bring them on to kind of the today's uh, technology, right? And it's fascinating you mentioned product market fit because um, UiPath um, has very much met a need in the business process automation uh, space, which I think probably for many years was considered a, a laggard industry, a kind of almost a legacy industry, but you've completely supercharged it and completely changed the whole way automation is approached with UiPath. Um, you product market fit, you absolutely nailed it. I mean, was product market fit the magic bullet which allowed you to just scale internationally, just straight away? Well, I wouldn't say that product market fit is the most important thing. What would you say then? I think it's the mentality of the leadership team in a company. I've seen many startups that believe that a technology is good in itself, maybe mm -hmm. in consumer space. Yeah. But in, uh, in B2B, that's far for enough. From enough. So 
You might find product market fit, but you are not able to exploit it if you don't understand how business works. What does it take to build a business? And that was maybe my biggest transformation from an engineer into a product guy and later on into a businessman. But it's, uh, I cannot stress enough how important it is to understand what does it take to build large sales teams to understand uh, how it is working, to understand customers' mentality, to understand to build an ecosystem around your technology. These are tremendously important things. Well, I'd be fascinated to know, I know you were a VC once before. Did either of you, this is a question to either of you, did you, were you particularly inspired by a novel or a, a book on strategy or a business book or a, maybe an individual? Was there a, a, something that just suddenly changed the game for you in the way that you thought about how you could make, create a, a really big, successful enterprise uh, or uh, company, startup? Was it, did you read The Art of War or did you read uh, Machiavelli or what was it? Sabina? Yeah, I have to admit that I, I don't have many of those books on my nightstand, <laughs> no? uh, to be honest. So I, I, don't, I don't think I have an author to, Not, no to do there. I'm more of a learning on the job kind of uh, person. So more like experience. I love to be thrown in on kind of the deep end of the pool, start swimming. I, I don't really, I mean, I hear a lot of sort of uh, interns in our company that say, oh, I want to do, first I want to do consulting and then I want to do, be in a startup and then I want to start a company in five to 10 years. And I'm asking them like, why don't you just start a company now? And in five years, you will be a great entrepreneur, even if you failed once or twice, doing that instead of preparing by reading or studying or doing consulting, I think is a more successful way. So just getting your hands dirty, going straight in, not worrying too much about whether you're reading the right books or being a consultant, etc. Right, what do you think, sir? Well, to me, it's, um, I think Paul Graham was uh, a big figure. Paul Graham. Yeah, of Y Combinator, was a big figure in, um, in really shaping my thinking around how to scale a business. So I religiously follow him and I, 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 really, I really like him as a person as well. Have you met him? No, I haven't met him. Probably now I can easily. You probably could. Yeah. yeah. But uh, he's, uh, he's a busy person, so I respect his time. I still... He's quite responsive on Twitter. He is, he is, he is. I follow him on Twitter. I had, an, I had a little argument with him on Twitter the other day. Yeah? Yeah, totally yeah. the one. That's, that's cool. He's quite responsive. In, uh, and I, I can say that also TechCrunch was uh, quite important in the... I absolutely agree. <laughs> no, see, I'm... Look, we, we've started from Romania, but... Ah, I and all of our founders are kind of a product of Silicon Valley. So it's... Yeah. That, the, that so. was the thinking, the, man, the mindset yeah. came from there. And I think, uh, I mean, actually, that sort of Silicon Valley culture of just go for it, just start immediately, you know, similar to what you were saying, Sabina, actually. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I guess that, you know, we might as well talk about the topic a little bit more. Bit more. Um, you're, you're, you're scaling up in, in uh, Europe with healthcare. You've scaled up in, in the business world, obviously. What are the, some of the kind of hurdles that you're seeing when you're doing your companies? Is it hiring? Is it culture? Is it uh, the regula having to deal with, with regulators or sell into, sell into markets? What are the, the, bigger, the biggest problems? Yeah, so I mean, healthcare is very, very local, right? And so mm. we need to put a lot of effort into thinking of how does the strategy translate? How does the product translate? Who do we hire, right? And we, we've tried to run things out of Stockholm and can't even run sort of Norway out of, of the Stockholm office, right? You need to have every, every uh, sort of department locally on the ground to really succeed. Um, that's not 
really, a, I think, a hurdle, but just a job we need to do and the job we learned the hard way of if you're going to be in France, you need a French person that grew up in the French healthcare system, understands sort of the, the very, very local flavor that you can't, can't really read yourself up to how this consumer market work, right? You just have to have experience from within. Um, but then apart from that, of course, uh, the regulatory side of healthcare is, uh, um, is, is a, a, I mean, a big, big part of our job. But I mean, the reason why we are fairly, I mean, I think we have a few good competitors that helps us lift the market, but there's not that many of us, right? And mm -hmm. the reason of that is, all the regulation, right? If it would have been easier, it would have been a lot of consumer apps doing this. So I think for us, it's also a competitive advantage that we're really, really good at navigating these kind of uh, highly regulated systems, very good at creating these kind of uh, policymaker relationships, and, and that kind of pushes us into new markets as well. So actually, that's interesting. So the, the hurdles to you building the company have always also created a barrier to entry for competitors and if, as you say, if you can crack that special source uh, in, in how, you, how you do the company. How about you, uh, uh, Daniel? The, uh, what, what are the things that you concentrate on the company? Is it you concentrate on, uh, on in scaling in terms of talents, in terms of culture? Uh, what is it? What's the special DNA? I think uh, culture and talent are uh, very related topics. In actually, in, uh, look, in the beginning, when uh, I've realized we are about to start, I also realized I am not an operator. None of my co-founders were operators. We are not managers, per se. So creating and maintaining a good culture was the only way to scale. Good culture attracts talent, interesting people, and you just have to let them do their best without controlling. And then uh, I, I tried. Initially, it's not about culture. People cannot define easily what's the culture of a company because you have many debates. You come up with lots of values, lots of behaviors. But I realized that it, it, you spread it out too thin. And then looking back at what we are, how we have started this business, we boil down our culture to one single uh, tenet. And this one is humility. So. And then, after I realize it, I start uh, really evangelism, the idea of building a company around humility. And I think we are the first really big global company that was built starting putting humility at the center of the culture. Putting humility? Humility. Because what do you let, mean by that? Well, let explain me that. Let me explain what uh, humility brings into the picture. It's, right. uh, First of all, it, uh, uh, it prevents you to hire assholes that are people that destroy cultures and companies and they are toxic. They don't survive in a humility environment. And then humility gives you a framework of a growth, growth mindset. You are able to listen to others. You are actually even more equipped to do bolder decisions because you are not afraid to lose to lose face and you are able to change your decisions you can and this way you can move much faster so humility is an interest and it's it, it it propagates into a lot of of the thinking of people but that's uh, that, that's that's not easy to implement it really in order to implement culture to maintain culture you need to measure it so what we've done, we, we've put culture as the first uh, priority of every leader in the company. We actually measure all our leaders by uh, a term that uh, we took from Google, and it's psychological safety. Psychological, this is psychological safety. Psychological safety of yeah. our own people. This is number one priority of every leader. They, they don't get their bonus if they, score, if they don't score well at psychological safety. That's fascinating, actually. It's not really often you hear about that, that psychological safety, as you, as you mentioned. Sabina, do you, would you agree with that, that idea, that put, putting humility at the center of the, the culture? I know that often, especially in startups, we, there's always this culture of like, go, 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 you know, kill it, crush it, etc. Hello, Gary V, wherever you are. Um, and actually, 
that can actually sometimes be, you know, there's nothing wrong with enthusiasm, but sometimes that can also be a bit toxic, actually, in a way, isn't it? If you're doing that constantly, it, it creates all sorts of strange pressures. When things go wrong, people are going like, they don't want to tell anybody something's gone wrong. Do you find that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think um, we want to be um, someone who comes in and challenge the local healthcare system, but we don't want to be disruptors. Can't really disrupt the welfare system. That would be, yeah. I think, a little bit dangerous. People might die. So we need to, to balance that, right? I think, uh, um, I mean, as, as Danny was saying, putting culture in the center, I think, is that key success factor, of course, of scaling across multiple big offices, right? I think we are, we are lucky to be in an industry where a lot of people feel like they, they need to contribute to a change. So we're like very, very mission-driven company, which of course makes it easier to build kind of a joint, a, a joint culture around, we want to make healthcare better in Europe. We have a mission to do that. Regardless, it's gonna be really tough. Uh, it's going to be really hard times, sometimes really boring, but also really fun. And, and, and we are the only ones that are sort of set up to do it. And I think that you need that when you're doing something tricky and hard and yeah. when competition comes or business model fails, right? What are, what are the, some of the things that you've done to actually do it practically day to day? Scott? You've got multiple offices now. Uh, you're a very large company. How do you coordinate uh, you, you've scaled internationally, but how do you coordinate everybody? What some of the techniques you use? Do you use like an annual, uh, a, sorry, a weekly all hands meeting, or you're obviously all different time zones as well, right? So, how, what are some of the practical ways you've managed to keep the company going along the same track with the same vision all together? Well, that's uh, really a good question because we are we are very distributed. Hugely, and, yeah. uh, and uh, look, I realized at some point that uh, people have to meet face to face once in a while. Otherwise, it's not working. You lose trust. It's not working only on video. You gotta just do you, this. You need to feel the person. Right. Read it. It's you cannot. It's only on person that works. And. Uh, we, uh, we have even uh, have a program in the company that uh, is a benefit for all our employees to spend a week into other office. Wherever they want in the world, they just go spend a, spend a week, work a week there on company money. And we, so you fly them to the other office and they'll stay there for a week? On their choice, yes. Yeah, they whatever. can choose what they, they can go to Japan, they can go to US, they are in Europe. So. It's very, it's mind opening to see different cultures in, uh, plus we have a lot of events. We, we have like a world tour of events and at each event we, uh, we, we bring a lot of people from our company and we use them like mini team buildings, people, people mingle. It's, it's this physical presence that is important. But if you are able to, sustain, this is costly. We, uh, we actually spend in uh, kind of travel and entertainment like uh, per, per, uh, per employee three times Google's spending. So this is really? data that I have. Uh, but it's uh, in the end, that's the price you pay to be distributed to because a distributed company scale faster than you, you won't find talent in one single location. So you have to access talent across the world. So in the end, that's a small price to pay. So d that's really cool. Distributed companies scale faster. Yes, because of talent. You yeah. cannot find talent. It's not, even in Silicon Valley, you won't be able to find all the talent required. If you assume day one you are distributed, then uh, you can source talent, whatever it is. If I'm going and search for you know, our CMO, I don't care where it is on the planet. I'll just get the best, the best CMO, yeah. wherever she or he is. How does uh, KRY do it, uh, Sabina? How do you keep everybody on the same track, even if they're in different offices? So, uh, I mean, we're getting up to 350 people now, so we're far from, from getting, I think you guys are 3,000, I heard. Uh, but I think we're relying on a few institutions that we do uh, every week, and a few ways that everyone does the same. So we, we still have a weekly meeting where 
everyone uh, dials in, everyone participates. We invest heavily in onboarding of new colleagues, so everyone flies to headquarters in Stockholm, spend three days together with other new colleagues, get to go through everything, and I think that is a great start to be part of a global team, wherever you're gonna sit after that. And then, of course, just making sure that I know how, I know how people are working with uh, um, planning on Mondays and retrospects on, on Fridays, and my keypad works in the London office as well as the Stockholm. It's kind of a few, right. I think, uh, just very practical tools to, to keep it going. It's so you, you, you make people feel comfortable wherever they are, wherever they're working. It should be the same office, just different size and maybe different languages around the coffee machine, right? Right, exactly. So it's, uh, yeah, so making th things consistent. Um, I mean, when you're, uh, I mean, obviously now that, now that you guys are both at, certainly at a, a re reasonable scale, especially in, in technology terms, technology company terms, when people come to you, entrepreneurs that you meet, for, for instance, and they, you know, uh, ask crazy things like, you know, how did you build this company, things like that. What are some of the things that spring to mind first when you're talking to other entrepreneurs? I think there's one thing, and that is find the right team. I mean, I think it's number one, two, and three. Otherwise, you can't do it. I mean, I, I, I got to know Cree from the investor side, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, was actually on the sidelines for the first uh, time. But the, I mean, the one reason I f first chose to invest was the team. And the one reason the I chose to jump on board instead of staying in the comfortable side of kind of the boardroom was the team. And I think that will make it or break it. And then everything else will be tactics, right? If you get the team right, you can do anything. Would you agree, Daniel? Uh, first of all, I, uh, I really like uh, talking to entrepreneurs. Yeah. It's, uh, they will always find uh, a way to talk to me. So they, they have just to ask nicely and explain me why and uh, and then uh, you know I'll do my best it depends basically my pitch is guys don't uh, underestimate customers don't underestimate you have to become business people even if you hate business people you have to embrace it and I also like to do angel uh, investment so it's, uh, it's, it's it's becoming lucrative for me I guess I guess you're sp playing in the right space. Yeah, saying. and I think what we we talked about uh, before coming up on stage that it, it's a long game as well, right? So you have to pick if you're solving a problem, you should pick something that you're willing to to work for because it, I mean most companies aren't built in two three years. Most companies are built in in, in ten years. You're on your tenth year as CEO yeah, of this company. Absolutely. So I think that, that that's what you gotta be sort of willing to do, right? Yeah. When you, when you were starting your companies, did you th have a vision to go, you know what, we're just gonna get it right h at home first, like you started obviously in Sweden, um, you know, let's crack that market first and then scale up. Or did you, when you started, do you, do you always have like one eye on the scaling side of it as well as where you were starting from? I mean, did you build scaling into the DNA from day one, or did you thought think, you know what, let's just get, let's just get Sweden right, or let's get this one country right first? Which came first? What did you decide? Well, to us, it was uh, obvious. We, 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 you know, starting a company in Romania, it's probably a bad idea, but uh, it worked in a sense because we couldn't have a local market. Romania doesn't have a local market B2B. In, uh, in Romania, you couldn't in have Romania, a In Romania, there is no B2B market. Yeah. And uh, look, we had to be global. From so day one. Day one, yeah. Actually, we didn't have a customer in Romania until like a year ago, really. One single customer. And only after we had tremendous global success, they came to us saying, we want to use your technology. Otherwise, people are very conservative and... Sabina, what did you think? No, I mean, I can only agree, Sweden, we are... I mean, we're less, less people than Paris region, right? It's tiny, you can't build... Uh, I mean, you can, you can build large companies, but you can't build 
mega companies and it, it never interests anyone in, in sort of the core team of, of the company or the investors to do a Nordic healthcare company. So I think it, I mean, we always knew we we're going to land here. Then I think the other side is, of course, that when you're part of the executive team, uh, when you reach a certain traction, you think, oh, now we nailed the whole market and we're ready to move on. And then you realize six years later, uh, six months later, oh, we still haven't nailed the whole market. And I think it takes you much longer before you can kind of move everyone's eyes away, right? I think, I mean, Spotify probably moved away sort of their, uh, all their eyes from Sweden, I think, after being eight years in the market, right? So nailing a market, that's, uh, you will think you do it every year and you realize you are wrong every year. I think you're right. I mean, you're coming from Sweden. If you're going to build a co big company, it was going to have to be outside of Sweden. You didn't have really a big home market, so you had to go international from day one. Often I meet entrepreneurs who are, you know what, I'm just going to do Barcelona first. And I go, why? You know, why don't you think bigger? OK, sure, test the product, but at least always have one idea on scaling up from there. Guys, I think we're out of time, so I just want to say thank you so much uh, for doing the panel, uh, Sabina and Daniel from KRY and from UiPath. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. See you guys later. <laughs>